when it comes to the kingdom of God, we ought to be able to encourage one another and lift one another up and because uh, we're all in the work together. Amen? So, if you would, I just want to get right into this. This is so good. And this is what I do. I've erased the first service. Now I'm beginning the second service. This is, God's just sort of, uh, it's a different, I feel a different spirit. So, it's good. And I'm excited about it. So, if you would, let's stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in John chapter 20, but before we read the scripture, let's prepare our hearts and minds to receive this word. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. Amen. There you go. Now that that cranks my tractor now. Let's go. I believe the word of God. I I trust in God's promises promises. to mold me, to to strengthen me, me. to encourage me, to save me. And to send me. me. Today I will listen. Today I will will learn. learn. As we're preaching through the book of John. I think this is number 57. 57 messages so far in the book of John. And I am absolutely in love with this book. Amen. And this is where we are. Chapter 20 verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposedly, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is to say teacher or to mean master. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. But God, thank you that you're the God who speaks. God, there's no other religion, there's nothing else in all the world where people have a mediator who speaks. But God, we do because we don't have a dead God, we have a living God. And God, I praise you for that. Thank you for the day that you approach us, the day that you speak our name, and the day that we repent and you become our Lord. Father God, if there's anyone in this place right now and they've never truly surrendered, repented of their sin and surrendered their heart to you, God, you speak to them right now. Salvation is not a cross around your neck and it's not a trick in your pocket. Father, salvation is a change of heart and a change of life. Father God, you come in power in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, you know, as we look in the scriptures, and I thought about this song we were just singing. He, he speaks to the sea. Um, and, and, but there was another one, and he stands in the fire with me. And when we were singing that song, it just got my attention. Can you, it doesn't say it in scripture, or I've really, and that's really not the point. The point is, is when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was in the fire, the three Hebrews, and they were in the fire. You remember that story? Amen? I believe with all my heart when the fourth man appeared, I think he just did this. Hey, I'm here. I think that's what he did. I think sometimes, if you've been in the fire, say amen. And I believe there's times in our life that the Lord Jesus just comes up and just kind of pecks and says, I'm here. I pray that during this service, can you imagine sitting in a service on Sunday morning on the Lord's Day, and there's not a time in your life, every, every one of us in here ought to have that pick. Or to something, God says, listen, I'm here. 
I know you're having one of those weeks. I know you're having one of those years. I know you're having one of those moments. And listen, it may be, it may, and listen, God does that when things are good, not just when things are bad. When things are good, sometimes we forget it's God who got us here. And he'll peck and say, hey, I'm here. Sometimes we, get, we can get so full of ourselves, we forget that the reason we're getting to experience what we're experiencing because we, we serve Jehovah God, the Alpha and Omega, the Lion and the Lamb. Amen? You see, now everything changes. When Jesus speaks, he reminds us in the hard times and he reminds us in the holy times. But he reminds us that he is Lord. And we need him at all times. Can I have an amen? When Jesus speaks to, the, to you, the blindness will be taken away and a new kingdom will be in front of you. When Jesus speaks to you, the word of God becomes like oxygen to your body. Men, today we're living in a day in a church age where men come to church and we don't think we need the word of God. Listen, the word of God should be like oxygen. When you're saved, this is like oxygen to your body. And you, you feel like you're suffocating when you're not getting in it. That you'll actually feel like there's a void or something missing. And today, our society is teaching us to just, well, I'm good. I, have, I, I can live without that. Let me tell you something. We, we, if we're truly saved, we can't live without this. Because this is, the re this is the truth. Now, remember, when we're reading the scriptures about Mary Magdalene, they didn't have the canon of scripture then. They didn't have, they were living it. We're reading about what they were living that's why this is so powerful for us to have this detailed account of Scripture for us. When Jesus speaks to you, the gospel message becomes your cure for life. And that's very important today. If you're truly born again, the most appreciative, your greatest gratitude right now is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe Jesus is real, say amen. You believe he lived a powerful life, say amen. You believe he went to the cross for you, say amen. And you believe he rose again on the third day, say amen. You see, that's the whole reason we exist. We cannot forget the blessings you have in your life is because of that. Everything that we have in our life has been because Jesus spoke to me. And this morning when we're in church, don't, get, don't come to church and say, well, this is just another Sunday. Brother, I'm going to tell you, this is not just another church, and this is not just another Sunday. Today's the Lord's day, and he has set it apart so he can speak to your heart about whether you're celebrating or whether you're struggling in life. It really doesn't matter. God has a perfect plan for your life, and he has the cure for what's hurting us and what's, and what's bothering us. When Jesus had not spoken to you, when Jesus has not spoken to you, unbelief will bind you of what God is doing. Today, I want to share with you a message and show you how unbelief will rob you of blessings and power of God in your life. And we learn this through Mary Magdalene. Now, remember last week, man, we bragged on Mary Magdalene. Here she is, used to be a prostitute, and all these things is in her life. And when Jesus touched her, he totally gave, he, she was a new creation in Christ. Amen? She was as faithful. She, she, she's not the Mary that washed Jesus' feet, not the sister of Lazarus, but she is one of the Marys that was at the tomb. She's one of the Marys that was there, that, that was there when Jesus is right in this powerful moment. And she is a faithful woman of God. Amen? But I want to show you what happens if you're not careful. Now remember, everything that's happening right now and her life when Jesus touched her and the life of all the disciples, grace and Pentecost hasn't happened yet. That's in front of us. We haven't got there yet. All of these things, when he touched her, it was real. The woman with the issue of blood was real. The Lazarus, when he was rose from the dead, it's real. When he walked on water, it was real. All these things was real in his life. But the resurrection hadn't happened yet. Friend, you can know who Jesus is this morning, but the resurrection hadn't happened in your life. You're not saved. You have to experience the power of the resurrection in your life, which means that you understand that the tomb is empty. People travel all the way overseas to see an empty tomb. Amen? And there's a reason. But because the tomb is empty, our heart shouldn't be. Now, I want to show you three things. Number one is the seeking of Jesus. Mary was seeking Jesus. She came early in the morning, just like we said last. She was early. She came so many. She was seeking him out. And, and it says, 
the verse, Proverbs 8, 12. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. I'm going to tell you something. The reason we should be here this morning is not to look and watch other people. We should be here to love other people. We should be here to seek the Lord. That's the reason we're here this morning is to seek the Lord. God uses the foolishness of preaching. He'll use teachers. He'll use our worship. He'll use so many different things. But God so wants to teach, to speak to your heart. He wants to peck on you. He wants to slow your mind. He wants to quieten your body so that he can whisper to you in the middle of this service, I'm here. He wants to get our attention. Mary Magdalene is again the focus, but she loved the Lord. She was seeking him. It says, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. You know you have known Jesus when you desperately seek after him. You know, church, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if I wasn't the pastor of this church, I'm not going to a dead one. I'm not going to a dead church. I'm not going to a church where people's not being baptized. I'm not going to a church where people's not being saved. I'm not going. I am going, find me something. Or, either, or Michael, we'll get it started, man. Stir it up. But God says the fields are white unto harvest. Amen? That means there are lost people all over our county, our state, everywhere. And we have to get our people understanding. We have to have a burden for lost people. When God saves us, when we seek Jesus, and, we, and, and when, we, when we find him, he's going to do Acts 1-8 and Matthew 28 on us. Both of them together. You're going to be empowered to be a witness, and you're going to go make disciples. And he puts them both together, and that's the reason every room that is born again in this, in this, in this building right now exists. To do that, that thing. Is to go out and reach people for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we do that, that's what seeking. Seeking is not something you do till you're saved. To tell you the truth, seeking Jesus doesn't really happen until he's touched you and changed your life. Woo, huh? Mary was seeking him because she'd done been touched by the man. Man, when you've been touched by the man, you're going to be changed. Amen? And when he are changed, you're... Listen, I know when I'm not being touched anymore. I know when there's, a, when there's a void. I know when something's missing. I'm not coming to church because I'm grading other people and want to see how they're living. I'm coming to church because I want to live for God. I want to be better. I want to show gratitude. I want to love better. I want to do these things. You see, that's the reason we come. But today our world is telling us to watch everybody else. Praise God, he created you wonderfully different than anybody else. Stop watching somebody else. You are gifted differently than anybody else in the world. So you need to live your life the way God wants you to live it and live it for you. Can I have an amen? I'm telling you, God has a plan. Listen, you know when you're seeking him desperately. What does that mean? That means it's possible for you to miss him. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, I'm just going to read a small part of this verse, but it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I'm going to tell you something. You can be in this service and feel God, but you're not near God unless you're near him at home. If the only time you feel close to God is when you're in a church, brother, I'm going to tell you, there's something wrong with you. Your intimacy with God, should, you should have a quiet place. You should have that prayer closet. You should have somewhere that you go that the Lord speaks to you. It may be driving down the road. Just keep your eyes open. Amen? And, and, but it, you're going to have a place. Church, listen, you can come in corporate worship, and you can experience a move of God in here, but that doesn't mean you have him. That just means you're experiencing him. There's a difference. Mary was in a tomb and she couldn't see him. She couldn't recognize him. She had been touched by him. And if you're not careful, unbelief will blind your eyes to the purpose of the church. And I shared this in the first service. 95% of all of our churches wouldn't be dying if we had people who were sold out and surrendered to Jesus in our churches. When you sell out and you're surrendered to Jesus, God's just, God can just do so much by accident when you don't even realize he's doing it. The greatest things that I've experienced God do was the things that I didn't know he was going to do. I didn't know it. I was just being obedient. I'm just being who I am. I'm just being faithful. I'm not being faithful because I want God to do something. I'm being faithful because he already has. You see, that's what we're missing today. It's almost like in our faith. We're trying to make a deal with him. 
And we're missing the whole point of why God has saved us. God saved you so he could save your children. That's not the church's job. That's mom and dad's job. The church was never designed to be some kind of, to, to, to run interference because the family is not what it's supposed to be today. The church is supposed to be a place you bring your family and you grow and you worship together. But it's not to take the place of dad in the home. Dad's always going to be the hero and there's nothing you can do about it. That's the way God has designed it from the beginning. When you watch it, what's happening with Mary here, it can show us, a, 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 um, a, a <laughs> it can be dangerous, but at the same time, it's so good when we can have this heart to seek after him. If we are commanded to seek God while he may be found, there must be a time when, when we will seek him, and, 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 and he may not be found. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, and it is. If God speaks to your heart, don't you dismiss that and say, well, I'll have tomorrow. You don't know that. The problem is we cheapen it. If God speaks to your heart today, I'm going to tell you something. You need to get an altar and you need to praise him. You need to get in your chair and just get down your seat and get prostrate. You need to praise him that he speaks to you. That you, If you can feel God, if you can hear God and you're, you're, you're sensing him, even in the midst of your struggles, you have something to celebrate this morning. Amen? Now, he shows us only, only a genuine repentance will lead you to know a great God. The genuine repentance, listen to this. A heart that treats eternity like it's something to be put off is not genuine. A heart that treats eternity like it's something to be put off. Young people, if you're thinking you're going to get right with God as you get older, you ain't never going to get right with God because you're treating eternity like it's something you can put off till you want it. When you, the woman at the well, remember what she, Jesus said to her? If you would have known who it was who was asking you for water, you would have asked me for a drink. When you're sitting in the house of God and God approaches you and he speaks to you and you know who he is and you can just put that off, brother, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you, have a, you you're, unless you have a disaster in your life, true salvation is not coming in your life. You can't handle eternity like it's something you can play the lottery with. Young people, if you can sit in the house of God and God doesn't permeate and get your heart right now at a young age, you should be more in tune with God than any age ever. The older you get, the more I wish I could go back and get the innocence of when I was a teenager. So, Brother Joy, teenagers are not innocent. Yeah, they're a whole lot innocent than adults who get beat down in life. And they're about mid, in their midlife crisis and all this stuff that's going on. And been through a marriage and all this other stuff. And you get beat down. If you're not careful, your heart gets harder. It gets harder and it gets harder. And there's just going to come a time where you think just God's not there. I'm going to tell you something. God's always there. God's always there for you. doesn't matter what you're going through. Your circumstances doesn't determine where God is. God's always there. God is with always reach of you. Once you start thinking that you can put eternity off, you don't know what eternity is. If you know that you're going to live tomorrow, raise your hand. Nobody knows that. If you know God's going to... You don't know if you're going to live a day or a year or 10 years or 100 years. None of us in this room, you can't make your heart beat another day. Once you stop breathing, it's stopped. The reason that we ought to be driven in worship and we ought to praise God this morning is we sit in this place alive and we're standing up on our own two feet and we're not in ICU or MICU this morning. That we have the health and our families beside us. You see something, there's something. When you have the ability and you have the understanding that you can seek Jesus, you have something powerful in your life. The devil wants you to make you think that you can't seek him. You don't, you don't deserve it. You, can, you, you, can't, you can't do it. Look at these things in your life. Listen, I don't have to look at the things in my life. I look at the things in Jesus' life, and I know how much he loves me. If things in my life could separate me from God, then that means, I was, I, I mean, that means Jesus died for nothing. If, if, if there was a way for me to make things better or get things right, I can't. He died for sin for all time, for all sin. All, I mean, everything. And he bridged a gap so each and every one of you in this room could come to him. You can seek God and you can find him this morning regardless of where you are and what's going on. Here's what I'm going to advise you on. If Jesus speaks to you, first thing he's going to have to do is quieten you down. 
There's no opinion in the Word of God. But there's a lot of opinions in the Baptist church. There, are, there, there, is, there, is, there is only an attitude of genuine repentance in this book. And that's it. You've got to come to Jesus in total humility. Total brokenness. God, I don't deserve a right to stand before in front of you. God, I, 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 can't, I can't save myself. God, I, I can't worship you with his heart. God, I need you. You've got to come to him seeking him. As almost, almost you've lost something that you know you'll never have, have back again. Can you imagine, Mary, after being with Jesus, I have a friend. <laughs> I'm telling you, and, and he, he, she had a friend in God, man. She was seeking after him because she knew she had a void in her life without him there. But can you imagine what it's like once you realize who Jesus is, what he can do? All these things, you have that in your life and you, then you feel this void. You feel this void. Listen, today is powerful. Mary, listen to this. Honor is always the reason we seek God. I'm here today because I honor God. I want to honor God with my life. I'm honoring God in my calling because I'm honoring God out of gratitude for my salvation. He has saved me. I was once a worm. Such a worm as I. That's the, that's the lyrics of Amazing Grace, I think it is. When you get in it. Is that right? The scripture, am I thinking right? If I'm not, we'll just, yeah, you know what I mean. But, 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 but we, it, it shows that, 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 that we, we, are, we are not deserving, but yet God has done something miraculous for us. When we seek him with all of our heart, and he, and he shows us this, we need to show him honor and respect this morning. You know what's the problem with churches today? People, they'll turn, they'll sit down and worship, they'll do this. If you don't play their songs, you don't play their music, you don't do their words, I'm going to tell you something. If a song has Jesus in it, and you can sit down, there's something wrong with you. And, these, and some of the newer songs, some people, somebody's grandbaby wrote that song. Somebody's grandchild wrote that song. And we'll have people sit down. Not in this church. Praise God, it won't last long here. But I'm telling you, worship is not directed by a note. It's not directed by what man has done. Worship is directed by what God has done. And when you have worship like that, the newest song you ever heard in your life is Amazing Grace. The most freshest song that you'll ever hear is How Great Thou Art. And it has the same capacity to worship as I can only imagine. It has the same capacity as loving my Jesus. There is no bar that grades this and grades that. What speaks to your spirit, man, speaks to your spirit because of who God is. Not because of who wrote something or who sung something or who did something. It's because of who God is in our life. That's what happens when we can seek Jesus for who he is. We seek him in worship. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to have a church that is headed in a direction our young people can't find some common ground in it. If our young people, if, if we don't have a heart for our young people, we're headed to disaster. Disaster. Now, don't get me wrong. Young people, I'm not catering to make our young people feel good. The millennial generation, if they don't get off their lazy rear end, they ain't never going to have nothing. And I'm not, can you imagine a church where we try to cater to a bunch of people who wants to be lazy? Absolutely not. We're going to be holy. You be who God called you to be. You don't have to worry about trying to please everybody. But then when we, our young people, they need to understand, you need to have integrity. Our, our middle-aged adults, they need to understand, you got to have integrity. Our senior adults, you got to realize, you got to have spiritual integrity. You know what that means? There's never a day you stop teaching our young people. There's never a day you stop investing in them. And sometimes the greatest investment that a grandmother can have is when you invest in a grandchild that's not your own. And you meet them at church and you love on them and you tell, hey, it was great to see you smiling in the choir today. Hey, it was great to see you in class. Hey, you know I'm going to fill in in this fourth and fifth grade class. Hey, I'm going to hold a baby in the nursery this morning. But God help us for people that all they do is just come sit in the house of God and act like we're God's gift. I'll tell you something, when you're God's gift, you'll act like God's gift. And you'll worship like God's gift. You'll seek Him. You can't be God's gift and not seek Him. You cannot be God's gift and not seek Him. Before I go to the next point, 
this is something I didn't bring up in the first service. I went right over it. And I don't know why. I do know why. I got wound up. But how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Romans 10, 15. This is what I wrote down. Mary was beautiful now because Jesus was beautiful when she met him. Mary became beautiful after she met Jesus because of how beautiful Jesus was when he met him. If you come in church and Jesus is something that's going to put a bunch of rules and demands on your life and you just don't want to get onto that, brother, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you hadn't met my Jesus. Jesus didn't come to give me rules. He came to give me a new heart and a new life. A heart that I can forgive with. Eyes that I can see with. Hands that I can serve him with. Feet that I can go with him with. See, he changed my, my, everything about my life because of seeking him. I realized how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Man, Jesus came to my life and brought the good news. So many years in my life, I would sit in church and I watched. I just watched. And it was just things. I'm watching people. But never God couldn't speak to me. I was so busy watching everybody else. I didn't ever just quit and say, God, just speak to me. And the day that he did speak to me, you know what he said? It's just like I can remember, I tell everybody this. I remember sitting in church, a lost church member of five years, and God said, listen, you've always believed in me, but you never trusted me. And man, it was just like, bow. I mean, that was the most powerful message I've ever heard, and those words didn't come out of a preacher's mouth, they come out of the Holy Spirit. And when God told me that, I knew immediately that there was something missing in my life. I'm sitting here grading and watching people I'm supposed to be loving. And it didn't make any sense to me. When, my, when I surrendered my heart and life to Jesus, from that day forward, I began to seek him. I come to church, I was seeking him. And the reason I'm in ministry today and the reason I'm, I'm called today is because I have always sought the Lord. In all things. And it keeps getting better and deeper and gooder. Amen? I love that word. I have to throw that in there. It just gets better and better. The, the, the more in tune, the more I learn. There is so much. I've read this passage a hundred times. But what I'm seeing in this passage today, I have never seen it like I see it now. It is more clear to me right now of how unbelief can cloud our, our worship and how it can rob people in the day. There are so many times today people will say, well, I was saved as a young child. You may have been saved as a young child, but did you live for Jesus as an adult? When God touches something, he changes it. When he changes it, he fills it with his spirit. And that body will walk around with the Holy Spirit in it, given the results of the Holy Spirit and what it does. Now, we're all gifted different. We look different. Some of us can sing. Some of us can't. Some of us can, can, are gifted in, a, in, in encouragement. And some of us are gifted in other areas. We're not the same. But we have the same Spirit inside of us. And the work of the Holy Spirit produces the same work regardless how big, short, tall, color, it don't matter. It's all one thing. Now, he goes on, he says, the seeing of Jesus, number two. Our lives are changed by God for God. That's why he changes us. But now the seeing of Jesus. You know, it says, and she wept and stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels. You know, <laughs> I love this, but it's the... Some, some very powerful truths are seen in these verses. You see, today we see the presence of unbelief. She stooped down and looked into the tomb. Among Mary and most of his followers during this time, they were, they were, they were, they were confused. They didn't know what to do. They were in a panic. They were walking around looking. And what happened at the tomb? What happened at the tomb? The first Easter morning... Most of his followers were full of unbelief. If they would have listened to the message that he says, you tear this temple down in three days, I will build it back up again. He told the people that he's going to rise in three days. He taught his disciples. He had the Lord's Supper with them. He told them, this is my body that's been broken for you. This is the blood, the new covenant. This, this, as often as you take this, do this in remembrance of me. He was talking about his body being broken. He's talking about all these things, and they totally missed it. 
Man, there's so many people today we come to church and we totally missed why Jesus wants us to be here and why he wants us to come. He's doing something amazing here in this woman's life who had been changed, but yet she's missing something. She looked, listen, she comes unhappy. I'm going to tell you something, church. I see people all the time when they come, they don't never smile in God's house. Praise God, you need to meet the same Holy Spirit I do. Listen, peace that surpasses all understanding. Is God a liar? He's not, is he? He tells the truth. And there is nothing in this world that can rob you of the joy that only Jesus can give you. Nothing. Not death. Not life. Not pain. Not addiction. Not alcohol. Not anything. Nothing can rob you of the power that God can give you if you will pursue him. I'm watching families today, man. And they only get, I mean, it's almost like they have a time clock. And we just punch in, and then we punch out. Brother, listen, living for Jesus, this is your church. If this is your church, say amen. This is your body, and you're expected to be and serve here. Jesus expects you to be faithful to the assembling of the saints. He expects that from you. Why? Because we got to grow up another generation. Another generation cannot know and learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, part-time believers. And by the way, a part-time believer is a lukewarm believer, and a lukewarm believer is not a believer at all. When you look in the Scripture, there's a lukewarm church, but you never read lukewarm believers. A lukewarm church is made up of half-hearted people. And a half-hearted people means most of the heart belongs to the devil, not God. The fence doesn't, God don't belong to the fence. The fence that we're all trying to straddle sometimes, that belongs to the devil. And the devil's trying to rob us. He's trying to rob our younger generation. He's trying to rob our churches today of the, of the inheritance that God has promised to you as a child of God. And by the way, we don't have to want for anything. My God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? He owns the hills too. We forget that. We become so desperate that we think, you hear about this shooting down in school in, 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 in Florida, and man, I feel so bad for the family, just like Ronnie had prayed. And then I, I watch people use this as something, well, let's take everybody's guns away. We cannot get any dumber in America than we are. The people that are going to shoot you are not going to pay attention to the laws. What that's going to do, that's going to make you be empty-handed with people who are empty-hearted. And when they bring that gun at you and your family, you're going to have no defense whatsoever. Guns don't kill people. People do. And that is the most foolish. These liberals. (laughs) They're so intellectually caught up, they're just dumb. Every time I read something like that, I want to go and I say, no, I want to go knock on their door. (laughs) Hey, you know if you die today, you're going to heaven. (laughs) There's a God that so loves you. He sought after you before you even knew him. That even while you were still a sinner, yet Jesus Christ died for you. I actually watched one comment. And I'm just going to say this. This woman was taking a blast on how we stand for pro-life and we stand against abortion. And she was saying, they're so worried about these babies in the womb that they're not paying attention. I'm just sitting there and that broke my heart, man. There are people today that think they're saved and they they have no respect for the human life whatsoever. The reason that our children are going to grow up in a third world country here in the next few years is because we have people that absolutely have no respect for morality. I mean, it's just a moral thing. We shouldn't kill to better our own lives. Did you hear what I just said? We murder a human being so we can better our own lives. And what they don't tell these these victims, I call them victims, 
What they don't tell them is what they've got to go through after they do that. And then you get, to, you get to minister to these people and love on them and tell them that there's a God that forgives them. Praise God that we have a faith that knows where every one of those babies are. Amen? When it comes to praying for our country, young people don't get caught up in this attitude that people's trying to do. You've got to do things God's way. If you don't do it God's way, then you're doing it the devil's way. Amen? When you get to see Mary was unhappy, then Mary was unresponsive. When unbelief grips your heart, you will be blind to the evidence of the work of God. When unbelief captures your head, captures your mind, when unbelief clouds your, your mind, you will, be, you will not be able to identify the work of God. I mean, I mean, I mean you, you, you've seen it. We've seen it. We've seen it here in our community. We watch people get saved, and there's people in the community that's out there making fun of people getting re-saved or re-baptized. I just want to say something for the record this morning. Born-again believers doesn't use the term re-saved, and born-again believers doesn't use the term re-baptized. When a person is truly born again, that's when they're saved. Well, I was saved, I thought I was saved at 12 years old. My life didn't reflect lordship whatsoever. When I was 30 years old, I was sitting in the service. God spoke to me and said, you believed in me, but you never trusted in me. That day I went down, surrendered my heart and life to Jesus. I had already been baptized. I'd already got wet. I had already been whatever you want to call it. But brother, when I, when I surrendered my heart and life to Jesus and I followed through believer's baptism, that's one of the, that was my first time to truly worship in church. And here's why I'm saying that. There was a local business right down the road. And there was a gentleman there that owned that business. And my mama had gave me a Bible with my name on it because she was so proud of me. I went in that place of business and I had my Bible. And I was so excited. I'd only been saved about two weeks. And I'm sitting here looking, man, just talking to everybody. Nobody had to tell me I had to go tell people about God. Man, I'm just talking to everybody. And this is what this man told me. What kind of Bible is that, son? I said, well, it's my NIV Bible, and my mama got it for me. She said, you can't get saved out of the NIV Bible. The only, man that, the only reason that man stood upright was because I was saved. Can you imagine somebody having the lack of wisdom to say that to somebody who had only been saved just a few weeks? Man, that discouraged me so much. I went back and I talked to some guys at the church and talked to my pastor. And he said, man, Joey, you're just going to run into people like that. They don't, they don't understand the change. They're so caught up on the rules that they forgot about the righteousness. You see, it's the word of God that's in me that makes a difference. Hide thine word in thine heart that I might not. That's right. I'm going to tell you something. When a new believer comes to Christ... There is no one who can stand up here and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you're not ready yet. A new believer comes. Now, it's young children we sit down. But I'm talking about somebody right now this morning, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher. And man, if somebody comes and says, listen, I'm, God's been convicting me, but I've been afraid. I've been afraid. And we don't understand that there are going to be people that's going to miss eternity because they was too afraid of what we were going to think. Who gives a good rip what anybody thinks? Mary, she was bold. She busted in that tomb. She's watching two angels. And she's so full of unbelief, she didn't even recognize heaven's messengers. She was so full of grief at that moment that even heaven's angels couldn't even do anything for her. That's a real place. That's a real place that you can get. And you're watching this. And then Jesus is standing behind her all the time. I wonder how many people come to church Sunday after church Sunday. And, 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 and they got so, many, so much chaotic in their life. And Jesus was sitting right beside them in the chair the whole time. And I, and I, and I, and I look at this line. This is so encouraging to me, man. This is so encouraging. When I read this text... I can watch and see where I, I think about people and I can see how they're so blinded and they're not full of joy and they're not happy and they don't, it's like they can never have, I've never seen a celebration of spirit in some people's lives. And I'm going, why? 
Why? What is it that the, 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 the devil has so much power and so much influence that, that God can't take it away? By the way, he's already won. Can I tell you? He's already won. We just got to live our life like we realize that he has won. Now, watch this. God can work wonders in front of an unbeliever's eyes if they will just look. It, Mary was not only unhappy, she was no longer, not, not only unresponsive, but she was also unattentive. She was not attentive. She, she, Luke says, why do you seek the living among the dead? You know, Mary was blinded for what was going on. All she could see in that place was the work of man. Oh no, somebody took his body. Oh no, where have they laid him? <laughs> Say, I love you, Brother Joy. Who got my chair? I don't know where they got my chair. Where did they put my chair? Don't you know I paid money and I've donated that chair to my grandmother's path on her great-grandfather's side on her cousin's uncle's niece? People will get upset and leave the body of Christ because somebody got their chair. And your grandkids are on drugs and addicted. And we're so busy walking around the tomb and Jesus is following us around everywhere we go and we're so hard-hearted and all we can think about is a stupid chair. This is a problem today. In s- Uh-oh. No, I, it's good. It's good. It's, uh, today we are so full of that stuff. We'll let the work of man interfere with the work of God in our life. And, 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 and look at what she's doing Man, it says in, 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 in verse 13, and they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Man, she was not attentive. She, she just wasn't paying attention. She had this unbelief. She turned around, but she just didn't recognize. She thought he was the gardener, which means he didn't have this bright light on him yet. Why? Well, he hadn't ascended to the Father. The word touch in that scripture means to hold on to, to grab, not let go. Once the, and that's, that's later on. I'm fixing to get to that in a minute. But that, that's, that she, she recognizes him later and she sees who he really is. But before he spoke her name, she couldn't recognize him. That's my life. For being a church member from the, from the time, from, from being a church member all those years, and I came to church and I didn't understand why people, I didn't understand why Jean Ham Hyman would cry when she'd sing, and I didn't understand why people in the choir would raise their hands and, and smile the whole time they're doing it. I didn't, I didn't understand why people just love being in the presence. I didn't understand why people would serve. I didn't understand why people were so faithful and they gave their money, man. They gave their money. What's wrong with them people? And I'm watching all this stuff and I'm thinking about that. God, and then, and then finally it got to the place, what's missing in me? What's wrong? I couldn't see. And finally, when I was fixing to lose everything I had, it wasn't money. I wasn't fixing to lose money. I was fixing to lose my family. It's one thing to have everything else taken away from you or lose your job or something like that, but to lose your family. And, you're, and, and to, to get a dose of reality that, well, man, I'm a man's man. I can fix anything, but I couldn't fix that. I went to church that Sunday, and, 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 and unbelief had, had blocked me. Unbelief will cause you to not listen to the pastor's sermon. Unbelief will rob you of God speaking to you about he wants you to go and encourage somebody on this side of the room. Unbelief will stop you from engaging in the body. Listen, church, the greatest problem we have in our community, in our county, is spiritual gypsies. They just go around everywhere. And they don't ever commit to nothing. They never hold a baby in the nursery. They never go to a small group Sunday school class. They never, they never do anything. And I know I may be talking about somebody in this room, but praise God, that's where the scripture is. God, come, God saved you for so much more. He says that you are more than a conqueror. 
He didn't just save you for you to come in and feel like you've got your fire insurance. He saved you so that you could go out and rescue people from the fire. And Jesus comes up in that Hebrew, in those three Hebrew guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I believe he just says, hey, it's okay, boys, I'm here. They just thought they could burn you, but I'm the God of fire. See, the hell, devil thinks he is the creator of fire. Can I tell you something? Fire represents the Holy Spirit of God. And God is the author of all things and the creator of all things. The only reason the devil has anything is because God just allowed him to have it. And everything that you have, God has given you. And unbelief, listen to this. Now, this is good. Now, hang on. How can a gospel-centered message anger someone who has been saved by the same gospel? It's a good question now. Let's entertain. When we preach, Paul says that I might preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, when the preaching today, we don't need no watering it down. We've done messed enough of that watering this down. It need, we need a full counsel. We need it preached. We need, it, we need to tell it like it is. And let the Holy Spirit lay. You will not have healing in your life for somebody telling you what you want to hear. You'll have healing in your life for somebody telling you what you need to hear. Amen? Before I get to deliver this, God's telling me what I need to hear. He's telling me, you need this, Joey. Listen, you need, listen, you need to focus. You need to understand. There's people in the church, and they're full of unbelief. They can be blind. They can know Jesus. Man, they can know how powerful and how precious he is. But at the same time, the power of the resurrection is not in their life. And this is where she is at this time. There is always, there's a way that seems right unto death, unto man, but it only leads to death. The same way Mary can be blinded by the tomb. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Let me put this chair back before I stumble over it. Uh, you know that tomb that everybody goes to Jerusalem to see? It's the empty tomb, am I right? And they say this is where Jesus lay. People go, we're going to take a trip here in a year or two. We're going to get together a trip in our church. And we're going to go to Jerusalem. I want to go walk. I want to walk where Jesus walked. Amen? I want to go and I want to walk where he walks. How can that place that all the believers now go to be a place of confusion then? The same way that we can sit in church and unbelief can blind us. Man, when your eyes have been opened, I want to go stand. I want to go kneel. I want to sing Amazing Grace at the tomb. I, I, want, I want to see the place. I want to see the Jordan where they baptized. I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, man, I, I don't know. I want to see it all. I want these pages to come to life. I want a live map in my heart. To see the hill country and watch where the shepherds tended their sheep. And, the, and to see all those things. I want that. But guys, much more than that. I want it inside of me now. I want, to go, I, want it, I want the deep things of God in my life. I don't want unbelief to cloud me. How can it do it? Do you know how many times that I have... Uh, one thing you struggle with in ministry is planning something because you think nobody's going to come. Do you know I think that all the time when we do something? I think, what if I plan this and nobody comes? Do you know something? That is the greatest enemy there is of unbelief in a minister. You'll sit there and say, well, I'm not going to do it. Nobody. Who gives a good rip if ten comes? Oh, last time I checked, one person's important. Amen? But, Will, we want people to come. We want to be faithful. We want to work through. And, and listen, when, we, when we're faithful to do what God wants us to do, he'll do amazing more than we could ever possibly imagine. Man, I was watching, walking around the parking lot today and looking, and we got to build more parking. we got to have more parking. We had a first service, and man, that thing, I mean, just cars everywhere. And, I, and I'm watching it. Thank you, Jesus. Yesterday, for men's work day, men were everywhere. Man, they're just serving and working and doing these things. And man, I, and, and Jay Beggs come up and talked to me, and I said, you know something? Your pastor's very encouraged today. Man, when you watch people come and serve and eat eggs and gravy and biscuit and sausage and bacon and, yeah, how many of y'all got something waiting on you at home? I'm going to keep talking. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's amazing how encouraging it is when your men show up and there was an army here. Faithful men in our church. 
And man, that encouraged me greater than anything anybody could do is to watch that. If I had it one time, I bet ten times yesterday, somebody said, hey, pastor, can I have you for about five minutes? Pastor, can I have you for about five minutes? Pastor, can I have you for about five minutes? Man, I got those moments yesterday, and it was just good. I got to meet with some of my guys and just have a little one-on-one with them. And man, it was so good. I love that. But do you understand that unbelief robs us of those things? When we come into the house of God, it's almost like if we're not careful, we just come. But we won't, we won't surrender our full self. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to be vulnerable this morning. You're going to have to surrender your full self. You're going to have to let God confront the things that you don't want to repent of. You're going to have to ask God to do things in your life that's just absolutely amazing. He, and he will. 1 Timothy 2, 3-6, through 6, For there is one God and one mediator between man and God. Mary saw the Lord himself and thought him to be the gardener. And I thought about this. You know, sometimes people just really don't realize who Jesus is. Jesus is not somebody who fixed my life. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is not somebody I just bumped into at church. He's my Lord. The third thing. The seeking of Jesus, the seeing of Jesus, and the last thing is the speaking of Jesus. And I absolutely love this. Jesus said to her, Mary. (laughs) Mary! And man, all of a sudden her eyes was open. You know what that means? That means the argument about the chairs stopped. The looking for the dead body wasn't there because he wasn't dead. All the things existed. Do you know how many people I've seen that their whole life changed that was wanted to cause division? And all of a sudden when they're saved, they all start looking at life. My goodness, this person over here, they, somebody needs to spend some time with them. Man, this person over here, man, they would be so good to work in this area. Man, look at this person. Man, I can see such a growth in them. Man, all of a sudden your eyes are turning toward where you see potential instead of where you see problems. God does it. God, every one of you in this church is potential, man. You're a potential to make a difference in the kingdom of God and with your families and with your children. The church is not weak. It's more powerful today than it's ever been. The church today belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and man cannot mess it up. You find God at work and you join him and you get to work in his house and you be a part of his work. But don't sit back. Don't sit back and say you have all these problems. Your problem is not sitting back. Your problem is sin, man. God wants us to be a part of everything that he's doing. And when he speaks, he changes. When Jesus speaks, the blindness is just gone. And I love this because then, why is it he told her not to, don't hang on to me. The word touch, some of your scripture may say touch, but it means don't hold on. And he called him master. Why? Because look at the next verse. Jesus told her, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascended to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and, and he, he told her that she needed to go. That she had something she had to do. God saved you because he's got something you've got to do. Don't just stand here and hold on to me. I haven't ascended to my father yet. My father and your father. There's two different. He's talking about his deity. He's fully man. He's fully God. He was virgin born and he was heaven sent. He was fully man and fully God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word dwelt among us full of glory and truth. At this time she began to see the true Jesus standing right in front of her. You did keep your word. You did rise again on the third day. You have defeated death, hell and the grave. There is nothing that can stop us down. They can kill us and take our body but not take our soul because now it belongs to you. Pentecost is coming, and man, we're fixing to get to that. That dog will hunt. It's going to be good. But now you're watching for the he. Can you imagine seeing Jesus and having it touching him? Oh, my goodness. She touched him in the tomb where he was put, and he was breathing. What was keeping him alive? Woo! 
Huh? He didn't have to have a functioning heart. He had a powerful spirit, brother. He is a great example of what we're going to receive one day. These vital organs that are wearing out did not limit his ability to stand up and touch her. We are going to be given a spirit. We have a spirit inside of us. That's going to be what drives us and what causes us to live now. If that spirit is powerful enough to cause us to function in a new body, how powerful should it be in our old one? You see, when Jesus, the seeking of Jesus, and she came and she sought him and she loved him, but seeing him, there's so many things and religious attitudes and things that can blind your mind. So here's what I'm going to ask you this morning. I want you to just kind of forget all the religious jargon and the things you know. And I'm going to ask you something. Can Jesus speak to you this morning? Have you been blinded by any unrepented sin in your life? Is there anything that's causing you to where you can't see the real true God? Mom, when you have to beg your kids to come to church, they miss the real Jesus. Dad, when you have to beg your kids to come to church... They miss the real Jesus. Brother, when you see him standing and he's right in front of you and you see his scars and you see everything he did for you, you'll never have to beg your children. Your children should have the same Holy Spirit inside of them that you have inside of you. They should have the same desire to come after the Lord as you have. There is absolutely no teenagers. You ought to have the same desire inside of you. And if you don't, there's a spirit of unbelief in you. You ought to have this same drive about you to want to see and touch him. And the more younger and the more innocent your heart is, you can just feel God speaking to you. I remember when, Barry, get ready to come on up. I remember when I was sitting in church, and I've shared this story many times. I was with my grandmother, and I was about seven or eight years old. And they began to sing a song. And they were getting ready. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember. I can, tell, I can almost tell you. But they were doing this song and, and I was sitting, I don't know why I was sitting down. But something in that service happened and made me throw my hand up. I wasn't saved. I was a kid. And I don't think, I, I'm going to tell you something, the innocence of a child can be so in tune with God it's just like they can feel. I know they may go to sleep, and I know they may do all these other things or pick their nose or whatever it is, young. I don't know. But I can tell you this. I think sometimes our children have a connection with God in a way that we don't. I think they know what's real. I think they know what's not. I remember that day that I got so moved in the service. I just threw my hand up. Anybody want to tell me what I did? Didn't nobody have to teach me to do that because I had seen so many men in church do it before. I was only seven years old. Why do I remember that moment? Because I knew there was something in church other than just going. God showed me something that day. It took a little while from there, but I know one thing. Today, now, I understand what did that. As an adult, do you? Have you had that time and that moment in your life where Jesus spoke to you and the blinders come off and you can see the kingdom of God? And you understand why he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You understand why he says that you are more than conquerors. You understand why he says you have abundant life this morning. You understand why he says he will forgive you of all your sin. You understand why we're here. We're not here to try to pay homage to a building. We're not here to do anything else except honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I am so thankful this morning that I never have to walk in another church member in another church building as a lost man.
And every time I'd walk into the building, the whole thing I would think about is my sin. That's how you can tell if your heart's right with God or not. Because the whole time you come to church, all you think about is your sin. When God saved me, and I come to church, all I get to think about is my Savior. Not somebody's better than me, or look at so-and-so. Or I, I, no. When you get to the foot of the cross, it's equal level and the same grace that was offered to me is the same grace that's offered to you and this morning you know in your life if you truly sought the Lord because if you did and you found him the blinders come off I get it now. <laughs> I get it that's why I know what kind of potential we have in our young people that's why I can see why how God, if God can heal my marriage, He can heal your marriage. Those young men in the first service had a chance to talk to. Him. Nobody knows this. Nobody knows who he is. But I had a chance to talk with him as he was leaving. He's never been saved. But he said, This morning God showed me I was lost. That's the hardest part. Until somebody gets lost, they can't get saved. Now, he wasn't ready yet. He's not ready. He got a good dose of it this morning. I spit all over the place, man. But God changed my spirit in this service. I don't ever want to try to remanufacture something. Different people, different crowd different circumstances here I am Lord use me let me say what you would have me say that means this message this morning for somebody sitting in this building have you ever truly surrendered your heart and life to Jesus does the Holy Spirit of God resonate inside of you has that fruit came out through your fingers and through your hands through your feet has the point of being saved transformed your mind if you've never had that happen maybe this morning is your time maybe you're a believer in this place and you know you trusted the Lord and you know you're saved but there's something in your life that's just interfering with you moving forward the altar I can tell you this if Jesus couldn't be found he wouldn't have told you to seek him don't miss it let's pray Father I love you